Out of thin air, another plane disappears, and the search is on. Mr. Wood um, was gasping for air. New questions about lethal injection after an execution that lasted for hours. From Sudan to the Vatican, the Sudanese Christian woman facing death for her faith meets with Pope Francis. And no rush to the altar, why young people are choosing to wait for marriage. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, July 24th, 2014. Good evening, thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick and looking at your news now, we begin tonight with a renewed call for a deeper look at lethal injection and the drugs used to make it happen. This after the nearly two hour long botched execution of a man convicted of a double murder in Arizona. People in the gallery watching the execution say Joseph Wood was repeatedly gasping for air every five to 12 seconds. Though a brief moment of calm came over him when he smiled at a deacon who was praying for him. Meanwhile, Wood's lawyers asked judges to stop the execution, but Wood died while a hearing was underway. Members of the victim's family are not sympathetic. What I saw today with him being executed is nothing to the day it happened on August 7, 1989. This was nothing. Nonetheless, Arizona's governor is ordering a full review of the state's execution process. Richard Dieter is the executive director of the Death Penalty Information Center. Now, this has happened before in Oklahoma. Is there a problem with the way capital punishment is administered, aside, of course, from people's moral objections to it? Yes, I think in our society, people reserve certain rights as human beings and that they are, should be treated with human dignity. And an execution that takes two hours where it's gasping and coughing, this is not intended by Arizona. It's not even uh, what the victim's families would want. They're, they're left with uh, being part of a system that has failed, and I don't think that serves anyone well. In both of these cases, Richard, doctors and lawyers tried to stop these executions, realizing something was gone wrong. But is there really anything that can be done once this process has begun? Uh, there was a case in Oklahoma just a few weeks ago where they did try to stop it and the man still died of a heart attack. You've already started the process of killing him and, and it would be better if it were carried out in an efficient way, in a humane way. I don't think the focus should be on how do we stop it, although, uh, you know, two hours seems like way beyond what it should have been allowed. So if the person doesn't die, uh, that, that says something about the system, something about the state, state's competence. And there's a lot of discussion about knowing what drugs are going to be used. In fact, Arizona tried to do that. A judge ordered that that be done. Apparently, they were able to go ahead. If they had known the source of these drugs, would that have changed anything? You know, I think it might have because there are experts around the country. There are anesthesiologists, there are pharmacologists who might have said, don't do that drug or with that dose or inject it in that part of the body or who are you having doing it because that's a sensitive drug to be using. But if it's secret, no one could comment. No one could advise the state of uh, Arizona what to do, and, and the recipe ended with a disaster. I, I, I think open up the process at least, and a lot of the judges said that, but in the end, as you say, it was allowed to go forward. And it is still secret. Yes. Why? It is because if they reveal the, the, the names of the companies providing these drugs, the fear is these companies will not uh, provide them anymore. They'll, they'll pull out and uh, won't want to participate. I, I think that's sort of the price you pay in a democracy. It's sometimes the marketplace wants to, to, to uh, express itself. So I, I think we've got to have it, the debate out in the open. The public needs to know companies if they get exposed. It's an embarrassment, but you know, that's part so of it, how we work. Yeah. Richard Dieter, Executive Director of the Death Penalty Information Center, thank you for your insight tonight. Thank you. So beyond the legal aspects of death penalty, there's much confusion about the morality of it. Tonight, our Catherine Zeltner looks at the question, what does the church teach? St. John Paul II challenged the world to respect life. Become defenders of life and of the right to life against the three facing it today. But is the death penalty one of those threats? Dominican Father Thomas Joseph White explains the church's traditional teaching on the issue. The state also has a right to self-defense in the face of an aggressor. So just like it's possible to wage a just war or an individual can defend him or herself under assault, 
it's also the case that uh, the state can defend the common good in a proportionate way. Which writers like St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas say includes capital punishment. Therefore, if a man be dangerous and infectious to the community on account of some sin, it is praiseworthy and advantageous that he be killed in order to safeguard the common good, since a little leaven corrupteth the whole lump. J.P. Chu develops the teaching, writing, The nature and extent of the punishment must be carefully evaluated and decided upon, and ought not go to the extreme of executing the offender except in cases of absolute necessity. Today, however, as a result of steady improvements in the organization of the penal system, such cases are very rare, if not practically non-existent. This point is also found in the Catechism, the official teaching of the Church. In the last 50 years, the Catholic Church has consistently argued that given modern circumstances of incarceration, we can protect the citizens of the, of the polity sufficiently through the means of incarceration. And so we don't need the death penalty anymore. It's, a, it's an argument from prudence. It's more merciful. It shows the Christian love of all human beings more deeply. Catherine Zeltner, EWTN News Nightly. Some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. A frantic search in North Africa for an Algerian plane that mysterious dis mysteriously disappeared from radar less than an hour after takeoff. Navigators lost contact with the Air Algier flight over northern Mali 50 minutes after it took off from the capital of Burkina Faso. The plane with 116 souls aboard was headed to Algeria. Wyatt Goolsby is at the Algerian embassy here in Washington with more on the search effort. Wyatt? Brian, not only are Algerian officials working with other African countries in the search here, French troops have also played an important role today. More than 50 French nationals were on board the plane at the time of its disappearance. But despite all of that help, there's still no sign of the plane itself. French fighter jets are among aircraft scouring the north of Mali for the plane. The French foreign minister said today point blank the plane has probably crashed. Passengers on board represented a dozen different countries. Burkina Faso's transport minister says the plane sent its last message last night at 9.30 Eastern time, asking Niger Air Control to change its route because of heavy rains in the area. The plane's disappearance comes after a series of worldwide aviation disasters. Last week, a Malaysia Airlines flight was shot down over eastern Ukraine. Investigators in Taiwan say stormy weather after a typhoon likely caused a plane crash yesterday that killed 48 people. Television stations in Taiwan show relatives of victims at the crash site, clearly distressed. Today, Vatican officials sent their condolences to those families in a papal telegram. The Holy Father learned with sadness of the air accident near Magong Airport, and he asks you kindly to convey his heartfelt condolences to the families of the victims and the assurance of his prayers for all affected by this tragedy. Upon all, he evokes God's blessings of consolation, strength, and peace. After the recent disasters, it's easy to see why your average flyer might be worried, but the numbers show air travel is still relatively safe. There have only been two deaths for every 100 million passengers on commercial flights in the last decade, still a far better rate than in motor vehicles. Uh, meanwhile, the president of France says all the indications they are getting on their end is that the plane itself did crash. Today, they held an emergency meeting in Paris with their government to talk about the issue. They say in all likelihood that difficult weather conditions did play a role. Brian? But why it is un it's uncanny, much like Ukraine, there's been fighting in Mali between militant separatists and the government. Is there any possible connection with that plane's disappearance? No, not likely, Brian. That's an issue certainly that was talked about today by both African nations as well as France. And they had, the more they considered it, the more they realized that the rebels there just don't have the technology. They don't have the weapons to be able to actually shoot down a plane, especially that high up. So at this point, officially still, the cause of the plane's uh, disappearance is still under investigation, Brian. Thank you. Wyatt Goolsby reporting from the Algerian embassy here in Washington. And meanwhile, Europe's air safety agency is lifting a recommendation that planes stop flying to Israel. Instead, they say decision makers should constantly weigh the risks involved. The agency originally made the recommendation after a rocket struck about a mile away from the airport in Tel Aviv. 
The FAA banned flights into Tel Aviv earlier this week, but that ban has also been lifted. The Sudanese woman whose story of courage has inspired the world meets with Pope Francis this morning. Miriam Ibrahim is finally out of Sudan, her first stop, the Vatican. Ibrahim, her husband and two small children, met with the Holy Father for about 30 minutes at Casa Santa Marta, where the Pope lives. Pope Francis thanked her for her faith and courage, and she thanked him for his prayers and solidarity. Ibrahim, whose father was Muslim, was sentenced to death, charged with apostasy for marrying a Christian. Sudan's high court threw out her death sentence last month, but she hasn't been allowed to leave Sudan until this morning. The Vatican described Ibrahim and her family as very affectionate. They're expected to spend a few days in Rome before flying to the U.S., where her husband is a citizen. Travis Weber is director of the Center for Religious Liberty at the Family Research Council. Travis, this meeting with Pope Francis certainly was a surprise to most of us. Is there any chance he might have been involved in securing her freedom to travel? It's possible. We can't know for sure. Uh, certainly Italy's role in this is, is uh, a pretty significant one. That also came as sort of a surprise. It appears that um, Italy had been working with the U.S. government to get Miriam and her family out of Sudan into a safe place nearby. Even though she intends to travel to the U.S., uh, she's safely in Italy now, and we're thankful for that. So she's expected to spend some time in Italy with her family. Could anything go wrong between now and the time she actually leaves for the U.S.? It's unlikely. Uh, you know, I think the, the chances of something going wrong were much higher in Sudan. Italy and the United States enjoy a pretty good relationship, and she's not going to face the type of social hostility she would have faced from uh, other citizens as in Sudan. This is not an isolated case. Women are treated this way throughout the Islamic world, and I wonder why this case has drawn so much attention. Yeah, you know, it's tough to know for sure. I think once a case gets a, a decent amount of attention in the news, uh, there, there a cre that creates a, a enough pressure that then, uh, you know, keeps the momentum going and keeps the pressure on governments to act. Uh, you know, it is always interesting how some cases generate a lot of attention and, and that creates a ball rolling on them, whereas others, you know, just uh, never get any attention at all. Do you think it might help others in this situation? I think it could. You know, as folks are aware that this is happening in Sudan, not only in Sudan, but elsewhere around the world, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, places where a situation like this could develop and, and some really horrible instances of people being accused of apostasy and blasphemy and other instances of religious oppression generally. As folks become aware of it being a problem in Sudan, in Africa, they'll be, they'll they'll uh, help. It'll help them to realize it's a problem elsewhere in Asia and around the world. Well, I hope you're right, Travis Weber, director of the Center for Religious Liberty at the Family Research Council. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Coming up, a major shakeup in Ukraine with the collapse of that war-torn country's governing coalition. And Israel's new president takes office today against a backdrop of violent conflict. When one lives attached to money, pride, or power, it is impossible to be truly happy. Wise words from Pope Francis's official Twitter feed today. Thanks for joining us on this Thursday evening for EWTN News Nightly. I'm Brian Patrick. Tensions in Ukraine, of course, continue, and now more uncertainty. As the country's prime minister resigns, this raises questions about the future of Ukraine's relations with Russia and the Western world. Jason Calvi joining us now with that story, Jason. A rocky few months for the Ukraine. It just continues, Brian. The question now is who will become the new Ukrainian prime minister? For one last time, Prime Minister Arseniy Yatsenyuk walks into parliament as their leader. But his message is different today. He's stepping down after less than five months on the job. If there is no new coalition and a valid one, the government of the Presidential Parliamentary Republic will dissolve and the Prime Minister must resign. I declare my resignation because of the dissolution of the coalition and because of government initiatives which have been blocked. Honor Ukraine. Today's decision follows much division within Parliament. Ukraine's president said earlier that all the opinion polls showed that their people wanted a complete rebooting of the government. The two parties will select a temporary prime minister. And Brian, an expert at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, says the move isn't unexpected that the president and other leaders were looking for ways to have an early election. Brian, that early election may take place 
this fall. Time for change. Thank you, Jason. Two new presidents in the Middle East to tell you about. Shimon Peres ended his term as president of Israel today. Former lawmaker Reuven Rivlin will take over that job. Iraq also has a new president. Fuad Basum is Kurdish, but known for developing good relationships with Sunnis and Shiites. Palestinians seeking refuge at a U.N. school came under attack today. At least 15 people were killed. Dozens are wounded. They were taking refuge at a United Nations school in the northern Gaza Strip. Israeli tanks shelled the compound. One Hamas spokesman claims the number of dead is even higher. It's at the fourth time a U.N. facility has been hit since the Israeli attacks began July 8th. And the International Red Cross trying to reach wounded civilians in Gaza is finding the task very risky. They come looking for the living and the dead, but have to turn back themselves under fire. Sniper back there. The Red Cross entered this battered and embattled Gaza City neighborhood, cautiously confident they could do their job. Up till now, I'm relatively comfortable with the security situation. I expect it might get a bit more difficult as we progress down this way. This area has been shelled almost around the clock for more than four days as part of Israel's offensive against Hamas. The shooting, it's not clear from whom, is too intense. Red Cross rescuers can't get close enough to help the victims, many of them trapped in rubble. The small arms fire is increasing in intensity and uh, directed at us. I think the problem is there are too many people here, too many civilians. If it was just us, it might be different. So we're, we're coming back. There are two people trapped in rubble, wounded. I want to try to go in on foot to get those two before we go back. With explosions up the street and perhaps sniper fire, there is simply too much risk, forcing the rescuers to pull out, leaving the wounded behind. Meanwhile, the U.S. is condemning Islamic militants who are persecuting Christians in Mosul, Iraq's second largest city. Last week, terrorists gave the local Christians an ultimatum, convert, pay a tax, or be killed. In an exclusive EWTN interview today, the Iraqi ambassador to the Holy See says the terrorists are stealing Christian homes and churches. He says Iraq's government is doing all it can. The ambassador blames the international community for not helping Iraq get rid of foreign terrorists. We will probably win these terrorist groups because it is the will of the people of the Iraqi army to fight against these jihadist terrorists. But in order to confront these terrorists, we need international support. Terrorists are a danger, not only for Iraq, but also for all of humanity. Mosul is home to some of the most ancient Christian communities. However, the number of Christians there has been dropping since 2003 with the outbreak of sectarian violence. As expected, a federal judge has declared Colorado's definition of marriage as a union only between a man and a woman unconstitutional. But he put that ruling on hold, giving the state until next month to appeal. However, that appeal goes to the Tenth Circuit in Denver, which has already ruled against similar laws in Utah and Oklahoma. The Supreme Court is likely to have the final say in this legal battle to defend traditional marriage. Colorado voters approved the definition of marriage as one man, one woman in 2006, though civil unions have became, uh, become legal last year in Colorado. The Urban Institute says if marriage trends continue, more Americans will be single by 2030 than ever before. Their recent report projects that 30 percent of American women will be single at age 40 if the trend continues. That would be a 12 percent drop from Generation X's 18 percent single rate. The study also shows marriage rates declining for minorities and lower educated groups. Overall, they say there's a widening gap between the economic well-being of married haves and unmarried haves not or have nots. Rachel Sheffield is policy analyst at the Devo Center for Religion and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation. So marital status directly affects tax rates and the eligibility for certain federal programs. What change needs to be made given this rising single population? Well, you know, I'm not an expert when it comes to tax policy, but what I can say is that this decline in marriage will likely have an, um, an influence on our welfare on our welfare system as marriage rates decline and what childbearing is likely to increase. And single parent families are much more likely to be poor and to, to be on welfare. So let's talk about the haves and have nots. Is it true that as a rule, people who are married do better, have more than single people? 
Generally speaking, married married parents or married families tend to have they tend to be healthier, they tend to be tend to be happier, and they tend to also have uh, higher incomes and to save more money. So um, they de they tend to do they tend to do better overall. So our system is set up now really with some incentives for being married. How can it really look at the unique problems that single poor people face without disincentivizing marriage? Sure, and I think part of that, um, actually, um, in our welfare system today, there are a lot of marriage penalties, and so looking for ways to reduce those marriage penalties, along with encouraging marriage, so that um, so that we don't have as um, as high a rate of unwed childbearing. I think that there is, you know, generally speaking, most people do want to be married, but in some portions of the population, uh, chi marriage and childbearing has really just become disconnected. And helping individuals achieve, achieve that dream, I think, is crucial. If we want to, um, if we want to have stronger families, when we're talking about marriage in this study, we're talking about marriage between a man and a woman, with right. the potential of having children. What about all this effort to? redefine marriage. How is that affecting this picture? You know, I think by redefining marriage, it essentially is disconnecting children from, from marriage. Um, marriage is designed to bring a husband and a wife together to be the, the father and the mother of the children that their union creates. And by weakening that definition, we further separate children from, from, uh, from their parents. All right. Rachel Sheffield, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. Up next, new research aimed at keeping you safe from deadly riptides along America's coastline. And some communities are disguising those ugly cell towers that have sprouted up everywhere. On Thursday, July 24th, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. Europe's top human rights court rules that Poland violated the rights of two terror suspects. That court says the Polish government allowed the CIA to secretly imprison and possibly torture the two men in 2002 on Polish soil. The court ordered Poland to pay these suspects more than $300,000. Well, about 100 people drown every year in, in the U.S. because of rip currents. Many more swimmers get caught up in them. Researchers are now setting up rip current data logging drifters off the North Carolina coast. They are designed to help identify the movement of rip currents along specific shorelines. This information will help researchers and forecasters learn more about rip tides. They'll form when the water is either rushing in and it's bringing more water in and then some of that water has got to come back out. The data gathered could lead to more accurate risk assessments and improve safety measures. Well, no cell towers, no cell phones. So we need our cell phones, so those ugly cell towers are necessary. But do they have to be seen? Catherine Elliott takes a look tonight. The birds are getting quite comfortable up here. I, I tell people that I planted that tree. It may look like a pine. Even parts feel like a pine, but there's no fresh scent in the air. But yeah, I know it's a cell tower. And you know, they put those things that look like pine trees up there to give it the effect of being a tree. Just the silent radio waves traveling to your cell phone. So when the company brought this idea that they, they have disguised trees, we, we jumped on it. Before the cell phone towers sprouted up in Cockrell Hill, Texas, three years ago, service was shoddy. It was pretty bad. Uh, since then, our reception has increased dramatically. And so have the ways communities are disguising the unsightly antennas. In Dallas, the Episcopal Church of the Transfiguration found another calling for its bell tower by leasing out space for a hidden cell tower up top. It's a little more prickly in Arizona, where a cactus doubles as a tower. Some stand out like this pencil in Missouri, others more subtle like a flagpole or a chimney in New York. Mobile phone providers eager to boost coverage while blending in. And for cash-strapped cities, the cell towers are often a source of income. Uh, we receive a check uh, in the amount of about $1,871 each month. No complaints about an eyesore here, as the disguise pays off. Pretty cool. Great idea, in my opinion. Catherine Elliott, EWTN News Nightly. Well, thank you, Catherine. And finally tonight, EWTN Grows West. Tonight, our network CEO, Michael Warsaw, and Bishop Kevin Van of the Diocese of Orange are announcing the construction of a new studio located on the 34-acre campus of Christ Cathedral. The studio expands EWTN's production capabilities, especially for Spanish-language channels. 
Well, we appreciate you watching EWTN News Nightly tonight. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, watch again anytime you like on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching tonight. Good night and God bless you.